My name is Joyce Kennedy, and I'm the Director of Community Relations here at Concordia College. Now I'd like to turn the program over to Rose Camille, who is Chair of our Traditional Undergraduate Nursing Program, who will introduce this morning's guest. On behalf of our Concordia College and the Division of Nursing, it is my pleasure to introduce Michael Cosina, President of our New York Presbyterian Lawrence Hospital. Some of you may not know this, but Lawrence Hospital was our first clinical partner when we launched our nursing program 10 years ago. This partnership was extended beyond nursing to our rad tech and healthcare administration students. Concordia has placed more than 500 nursing in clinic students in clinical rotation in the, this facility. The access to clinical practice at NYP Lawrence Hospital is making a real difference in the quality of education of our nursing and graduate students. And now to introduce Michael, our guest speaker. Michael began his career at the former New York Hospital in 1990 and has worked on multiple New York Presbyterian campuses in a variety of roles with increasing responsibility. His most recent roles have been Senior VP and COO of um, New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan and VP and Executive Director of New York Presbyterian Allen Hospital. Michael also served as Director of Integration and Accreditation for the newly merged New York Presbyterian Hospital. Prior to the merger, he worked at both the former New York Hospital and the former Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. A graduate of the University of Delaware, Michael earned his Master's from Columbia University's School of Public Health. He is board certified in healthcare management and a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, where he serves on his board for, of governors. He is a fellow in the New York Academy of Medicine and has served as a health and aging <coughs> policy fellow and congressional fellow. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Michael Fossil. Rose, thank you. I want to thank Rose and uh, Joan for inviting me. Um, and Joan, thank you for reminding me to turn off my cell phone. The last thing I want is it to go off while I'm standing up here. Um, just. How many students do we have in the audience? Just so I have an idea of, wow, well, you got a lot of students here, okay. So we'll make some adjustments to uh, some of the things that we're talking about to make it uh, relevant uh, also. Um, but you heard a little bit about my background. I've spent my entire career at um, New York Presbyterian Hospital um, in its current role and then at each of the former um, campuses uh, before we merged. And the New York Presbyterian came about in January 1st of 1998 when the former Columbia Presbyterian Hospital and the New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center merged. And that occurred back in, in 98. Um, it was, a, I think, a brilliant strategic move by the boards of both hospitals at the time. Uh, at that time, healthcare was changing. Healthcare is always changing. If any of you are in healthcare, get used to that. That's part of uh, what we live through. But it was changing at the time. And if you remember, HMOs started to come around, the insurance started to change. 
and larger systems needed to start to be created. And at the time, the, the boards of the two hospitals had gotten together and pulled it together as one. It was fully asset merger. And you think about it strategically, the Columbia campus at that time, but they both had international reputations. Columbia at the time, their local, local service area went north and west, and the New York Hospital service area went south and east. But they all both pulled in people from across the country and across the world to come to those campuses. So when they came together, it geographically covered the, the New York metropolitan area for a primary service area. The other thing that was really strategic about it was the two hospitals who were independent at the time didn't compete in some of the high, highest end clinical services. So for instance, the Columbia Presbyterian has a world renowned um, cardiac transplant program. So at the time, back in the 70s and 80s, New York Hospital said, well, we're not going to do that because they have that market. Let's invest in a different service line. New York, at the Cornell campus, they had a burn center, one of the premier burn centers in the country. So Columbia didn't invest in that. So you can go through the highest end of the clinical programs and they each had something different. So when they came together, it brought one of the most comprehensive, largest academic medical centers in the country and it brought them together under one roof. Now we have one hospital, but we have two medical schools. The Columbia uh, University College of Physicians and Surgeons and the Wall Cornell Medical College. So we're, we're a large academic teaching institution. And so our partnership with Concordia and the School of Nursing at Lawrence fits right in to that as a teaching institution. New York Presbyterian over the last 15 years has been ranked in U.S. News and World Report as one of the top 10 hospitals in the country and certainly um, one of the top and the top hospital in the state of New York and New York metropolitan area. And that's because of the investments we have and the partnerships we have with our physician groups at both of the medical schools and the hospital. You fast forward to 2009, the Affordable Care Act has started. Uh, healthcare is changing again rather rapidly. You're moving forward, the hospital both, you know, had to, both all of the healthcare institutions had to uh, develop partnerships and larger healthcare systems. And that was sort of pushed in the direction from are the ACA. And so what New York Presbyterian did at the time started looking at where is our geographical reach? How do, we, how do we bring the care we have at New York Presbyterian to the local communities? And they started thinking through who our partners were in the communities where our patients come from and started to make changes to the relationships with those community hospitals. And through that, at the same time, the New York State was pushing that, that these large healthcare systems take much more of an active role in the management of these hospitals. And so we, called, we went from a passive parent relationship to an active parent relationship, which means the systems you know, would manage those local community hospitals to ensure that the services that will be provided are at the highest quality, that the access will increase, and that they'll all be financially stable. At this day and age, it's very rare that you'll see an independent community hospital. They can't compete with the insurance companies for reimbursements, with the suppliers for group purchasing and discounts, and they just don't have the financial capital to continue. The United States has moved into a very different direction as there's focus on healthcare to reduce the overall healthcare spending. The GDP is 17% uh, of it, that's healthcare. It's the largest budget, or one of the largest budget items in the federal budget, and how do we change that? 
And so as an institution, our job is to help do that. We have to be participating in what's going on in our local environment. We have to participate in what's going on um, nationally. We're a large institution. So we started to adjust and change and acquire some of the community hospitals and we created a regional hospital network and Lawrence Hospital was the first one that became part of that network. And that occurred in July of 2014. That was the first regional hospital, but if I step back a second, the New York Presbyterian Hospital has six campuses. And when the merger occurred, they had five. And those campuses are our Columbia Presbyterian Campus, our Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital, our Allen Hospital, and those are associated with our Columbia doctors. And then we have our Wild Cornell Campus down on 68th Street, and then we have our Westchester Division on Bloomingdale Road in White Plains, and they're associated with our Wild Cornell Campus and our Wild Cornell Physicians. In July of 2013, the hospital acquired the former New York Downtown Hospital and made that New York Presbyterian Lower Manhattan Hospital. And that became the sixth campus of New York Presbyterian. So that was the first merged hospital that we brought in. And those six campuses have about 2,400 beds under one operating certificate. In 2014, as I said, then Lawrence came in, but there was a different structure, and that became the first regional hospital to join New York Presbyterian. And then in 2015, we added Hudson Valley Hospital. In 2016, uh, New York Presbyterian Hospital Queens in Flushing. And in December, we'll add New York Presbyterian Brooklyn Methodist Hospital. So those four hospitals will be part of our regional hospital network. So overall, there are 10 hospitals in the New York Presbyterian Enterprise. Six at the New York Presbyterian Hospital and then four which are our regional hospital networks. That all rolls up to our president and CEO, Dr. Stephen Corwin and our New York Presbyterian Board of Trustees. So why do we do that? We did that again to bring the care of New York Presbyterian to the local community, to increase the access, to increase and expand on the quality, and to make it easier and convenient for our, our patients. The world has changed, and it is a world of consumers, for consumers. People vote with their feet. If you think about it, below 287, there are nine hospitals. Westchester is a highly competitive market. There are large medical groups. There are nine hospitals. And that's if you don't go down into New York City. And then you hear people talk all the time about, well, you have to go down to New York City for care. Well, our board and our executive team in New York Presbyterian said, well, we don't need to do that. We can bring our care to the local community. And that's what we're going to do. And that was the advent of creating the regional hospital network. So Lawrence is a 290 bed community hospital. We'll discharge about 12,000 people a year. We'll see 45,000 people in our emergency room and in our ambulatory care environment. We'll see several hundred thousand people over the course of the year, which is exactly what you want. You want more people in the outpatient setting <clears throat> getting their care, not using the emergency room, and only coming to the hospital if you actually need to be admitted. We don't want people in the hospital who don't need to be there. They shouldn't be there. They should be cared for in the community, and that's why you hear more about population health. Healthcare is changing. We're going from volume to value. ACOs are being created. Reimbursement is changing. There's bundling now. So the government now 
has, uh, is um, experimenting with bundling for orthopedic hip and knees. So they're saying, we're going to give you one price, and you're going to take care of the patient in the doctor's office, in the hospital, if you send them to a nursing home, into the nursing home, if you use home care, whatever services you use, here's what you're going to get paid, and you distribute that amongst the providers. It's a different model, but we're going to have to get used to that. The world is changing. The economics of healthcare are changing, something that we'll have to deal with every day, all day. So coming to Westchester, was I said, it was to expand our access. So in Westchester right now, New York Presbyterian has three hospitals. In Lower Westchester, we have Lawrence. In Northern Westchester, <clears throat> in Peekskill, we have our Hudson Valley Hospital. And as I said, in White Plains, we have our um, inpatient behavioral health facility. And so the goal of what we're doing is to expand to the local community. So at Lawrence, over the past year, we've added a lot of new subspecialists that weren't currently in the local environment. And we do that so you don't have to go down to New York City. We bring our Columbia doctors and who are partnering with us and we, we meet with them uh, weekly to talk about clinical services. And over the, um, over the past week, actually a week ago, we opened up our new cancer center and operating room pavilion, which I'll show you a little bit of that um, a little bit later. But the goal of that was again, what are the clinical services? What are the uh, physician clinical practices and pathways that we use to care for patients at our New York Presbyterian campus in New York City? And how do we bring that here to the local environment? So the same processes, same procedures that we have downtown, we've brought here. We have doctors who practice down at Columbia. They practice here at Lawrence. That's pretty powerful. You're taking one of the best institutions in the country and in the world, and you're bringing that locally. You're given the residency opportunity to get their care in their neighborhood, and that's what this is about. If you're having chemotherapy and you have to go into New York City every day for several weeks for chemotherapy, that is a, a large burden. And, you know, on the family and exhausting for the patient. So how do we bring that care here? And we do that through, through Lawrence. So we now have a beautiful new infusion unit that patients can get their care here. So they can have surgery down in the city. They can have surgery at Lawrence. Now, there's a lot of historical relationships between patients going down to our hospitals in Manhattan and getting their care there, and, and they'll stay there because they have long-term relationships. But now, with these regional hospitals, they can get some of that care right in their community. So there's a patient who this week, who's, who's oncologist, is down at our Cornell campus, and they talked about, well, you can have your infusion right here at Lawrence. So, She'll have her infusion here, and we'll have, make sure the medical records and all of her information is sent down to her physician down in Manhattan. So we coordinate that care. And that's what we're trying to accomplish. A year and a half ago, Lawrence opened up a cardiac cath lab. There was a need for cardiac services in Westchester. Lawrence opened up a cath lab. It continues to grow every month. We'll do over 1,200 procedures this year. The same interventional cardiologist we have at Columbia who do cases at Columbia do cases at Lawrence. It's the same policies. It's the same procedures. It's the same credentials that we have with our physicians downtown as well as here. Now, Lawrence has had a very strong foundation of physicians in our community. Most of them are in the primary care. We had some subspecialists, but with the, with the um, 
advent and the partnership with New York Presbyterian, we were able to add more subspecialists to the community. And that's what we were trying to do. The economics of healthcare are, it's one of the largest industries around, certainly one of the largest industries in Westchester. And at Lawrence, we employ about, with our physicians, probably close to uh, 2,000 people. The economic impact that has been estimated on Lawrence in the Westchester community is about $350 million annually that it gets invested into the local community, whether it's through our, our employees who are here and then the ripple effect that has in the local community, whether it's our physicians, whether it's our capital investments we make, that's pretty significant. It's a pretty significant number. And if you think about that, and you add Hudson Valley, and you add our Westchester division, New York Presbyterian has a large economic footprint in Westchester County. You also should be able to get to one of our doctors or hospitals in Westchester County within 15 minutes. And so they are in strategic locations. So the ability to bring our care to the local community is what the goal was, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Now, we've made major investments in, in service lines over the last uh, 12 months. I talked about cancer. I talked about cardiology, our stroke and our neurologist our OBGYN and our orthopedics. Those are the first five service lines. We're really um, expanding into the local community by adding more doctors to that. You see the joint, the joint program, the total joint program has been certified as one of the top joint programs by our joint commission. Um, Lawrence's uh, stroke care um, has been gold certified. Our emergency room for our cardiac care and our stroke care um, has been gold certified by both organizations that uh, are certifications that do that. And that's what, that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're uh, increasing the quality across the board. How do you become the premier healthcare institution? Right? So we have to look at ourselves internally. How are we operationally managing the hospital? How are physicians managing? What are the standards they are using in their offices? What are the standards and policies that we're using in the hospital? If you look at it from a board perspective, our NYP board perspective, they have 10 hospitals. So how are we doing that? So you take an indicator. You take our length of stay, you take our quality scores. What they're able to do is to see that indicator and we, we look at each hospital across the board. So you can say, what is the length of stay at Columbia, at Cornell, at Lawrence, at Allen, at Lower Manhattan? So the board can see that we're creating one standard of care across all of our hospitals. The goal is when you walk in the door of New York Presbyterian, you have one standard of care. And so we're undergoing a lot of change at Lawrence, but it's good change. It's not that Lawrence is doing anything wrong. It's not that any of the regional hospitals were doing anything wrong. They're all good institutions, which is why they're all part of New York Presbyterian. But we want to standardize it. We want to make it the same. We want to ensure quality. And that's how we're doing it. We're taking our policies, we're implementing them. What you could do now with our emergency room, and uh, I met one of the students walking in, she's in digital health or digital IT. We now have telehealth in our emergency room for stroke, for behavioral health. So you come into our emergency room and it's two o'clock in the morning and we need a a neuro consult or neurosurgical consult 
we can connect down to Colombia. They're there. They can do that consult from our emergency room. We want a second opinion. They can do that. And that happens all the time. It doesn't just happen from Lawrence to Columbia. It happens within Columbia. It happens within Cornell. Doctors talk to each other all the time to make sure they're making the right decision and the best decision for the patient. We always want to put the patient first. We always want to put the patient in the right place at the right time for the right care. Whether that's in ambulatory surgery, whether it's inpatient, whether it's in a skilled nursing facility, or whether it's home care, what is the right treatment? And there's discussions that go on all the time about that. It's an exciting time. It's exciting for me to be here. Uh, it's exciting for me to be in Westchester. I'm, I'm local. So I was born and raised in New Rochelle. I still live there. So coming to Lawrence, it's a 15 minute ride. Whereas before when I was going to Lower Manhattan, it was an hour and a half. I've saved 13 hours a week in commuting. <laughs> You'll see. So there's about 200 or so million dollars in capital investments that are being made into, into Lawrence. And so when you go back again to the economics of it, that's a significant amount of investment in Westchester County. And you hear the Westchester County Association and you hear the Business Council of Westchester talking about health care and what it's doing for the local community and how that's driving more jobs, which is forcing more housing which is forcing different and changes to transportation. So it's a big economic engine uh, for the local community. But we also like to partner with the community. So we've put a lot of our Lawrence executives on different boards in the local community. We want to partner with the community, sponsoring events, be a true partner. That's what hospitals are supposed to be. That's what healthcare is supposed to be. We're supposed to be partners in the community. We're supposed to be there for the community in their time of need. Whether that's for a medical issue they have, whether that's the Northeast loses power and there's no air conditioning. For some of our elderly, you bring them into the hospital, you have air conditioning, you protect them. That's what healthcare institutions are supposed to do. And that's what we do. And that's what we'll continue to do. You can't be everything to everybody, so you have to ensure that you have access to different services in, in, in different locations. It's just too cost prohibitive to have every service in every location. So that's why we're strategic in where we put things. We know the volumes. We anticipate what's coming. There's a lot, lot of strategic planning that goes on, a lot of data that's looked at. There's a lot of changes in the technology. And you want to be able to have that medical record interface go across the board so you don't have to get papers and you don't have to have CDs to take with you. But that's a major transaction and a major change to make all of that happen. But that's, but that's what's going on, and that's why we have those second opinion digital health in our emergency rooms and in our ICUs to make that simple and convenient. Now, there's a lot of students in the room, so let me just give you a little history on some of the things that I have done. You heard a little bit about my background. Um, I have been fortunate. I've been fortunate to stay at one institution for my entire career, which is sort of rare nowadays. I think in my parents' time, our parents all stayed at one institution for a majority of the career, if not their whole career. And I've been fortunate to do that. But I took a, um, you know, a, I'm a little bit more of uh, um, a risk taker than most, I think. And uh, I took jobs that nobody wanted, right? Because somebody 
at a high executive level needs something done. And you'll see when you get into the work world, people will say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And so what happens? That all rolls downhill. And who's at the bottom of the hill? Right? And I would always go, I'll do it. And I did that strategically because it got me in to a whole lot of different areas of the hospital. It got me into a whole lot of different areas into the ambulatory care setting, into working with our doctors in the medical schools, in developing and writing certificate of needs or into the regulatory environment. I always looked at my background and said, I, I knew I wanted to run a hospital one day, but I said, well, how am I going to get there? W what do I have to do to separate myself out from everybody else? So a lot of people get into one department and they stay there and they're waiting for that promotion. And they're still waiting for that promotion, right? I went into areas I, was, I didn't know. So one of the first departments that I took over was a methadone maintenance program. I didn't know anything about methadone, right? But they had trouble, um, and their, the administrator had left, and they needed someone to go in in the interim to manage it. So I said, Michael, we need you to go do this. I'm like, all right, sure. No problem. I left the office. I went to the medical school library, and I said to the librarian, you guys got any books here on methadone? <laughs> right? I didn't know. So I wanted to read up on it to understand it. Now, certainly there's the business side of healthcare. So what's our, what are our checks and balances we have in the system for caring for patients, for uh, managing uh, the finances of it for the quality, that stuff sort of is easy, right? But you needed to also understand what was going on with the patient. What, what does this treatment do? You also had to be able to talk to physicians. And if they realized very quickly, you don't know what you're talking about, you're going to have an inherent conflict. So I took opportunities to take different roles in the hospital that I, was, I didn't know about. But I liked doing that. I liked learning something new. I liked rolling up my sleeves and trying to figure something out. I have colleagues who started with me over 20 years ago, and they're in the same job. And they're like, how do I get promoted? Right. So when you go out there, you have to figure out how you're going to separate yourself out from your colleagues in whatever business that is. But, but you gotta, you got to like change. you got to embrace change. I don't want to um, just keep the trains running. I like to see a blank landscape, figure out, all right, got to build a train station. I got to figure out how to build the trains, and I got to figure out how to get that train running. And that's the mental challenge that I find stimulating, that I like to do. It is hard. It is hard. And what's the easiest thing for everybody in any corporation to do? Say no. No, can't do that. Why? Because then they don't have to think about it. You're changing something that is going to impact what they do or possibly could impact what they do. So that, no, I don't want to do that. You can't do that. But so now you've got to figure out, well, how do you get to your end goal that you know is in the best interest for the patients, you know is in the best interest for the organization, and how do you get that accomplished with barriers in the way? And you have to figure it out. So you have to be creative. You have to have personal accountability to know, I've got to get this done. But you also have to be a team player. And you have to be able to ensure that people realize that you're moving in the direction the organization wants. 
but you have to figure out how to create that roadmap to get to the end game. I, I've enjoyed everything I've done. I've worked on all of the campuses, almost all of them, because we now have a lot of new ones at New York Presbyterian. Um, and I love being here at Lawrence. I consider it my local community hospital. I love the fact that we're increasing access. I love the fact that we're um, enhancing the quality. I love the fact that the healthcare is changing. I love the fact that we're adding new clinical services to the program. I love the challenge. That's what's fun about it. Let me show you very quickly a couple of, this is what Lawrence, this is a $70 million project that and we have one of our board members, Richard Dresdale, who's there in the back. Um, years ago, five or six years ago, Lawrence, the former CEO and the board at Lawrence had the foresight to say we need to um, add a new facility and to open up a cancer center to provide an integrated cancer program into Westchester and to expand and to um, upgrade the operating rooms. And they did that. Now, these type of programs take a long time. They take a long time to get approvals from the state. They take a long time to design. They take a long time to build. But last week, we opened up the cancer center. And this is Lawrence, and we're right down the road, for those of you who are not from the area. And this is our new wing, right here. It's a $70 million project. So when you go back to the economics of it, the number of people who do construction who are here, where do they go get lunch? In downtown Bronxville, right? They go buy clothes, they go get lunch, they have dinner, they go to the bars after work, whatever the case may be. So they're feeding the local economy. So that's the interior entrance. You're in the hospital, and that's the entrance to our cancer center. This is the, the new waiting rooms. This is our infusion base. Last week I was on the elevator. I was walking down, I was talking to uh, one of the members of the community and she said, oh, I just saw the new cancer center that was opening up and their patient turned and said, you saw the cancer center, the new cancer center? I'm going there next week. And she's been coming to infusion at the hospital for several years. And she said, I heard you only have single private rooms and you can't talk to your colleague. And she said, we've developed a real social um, support group for the people who come for infusion. They come the same time each day of the week. So they develop relationships, they develop friends, and that's great for recovery and that's great for care. And she said, I, I want to be able to talk to all of the people I've been having infusion with. And we said, no, it's wide open space. So in each of these spaces, there are two infusion base and then over here so they can keep their um, feel and they can keep their social um, part of their health care. <coughs> These are the new operating rooms, state-of-the-art operating rooms. There's most advanced sophisticated equipment um, that there is. Our, our surgeons are waiting to walk into these rooms and they'll start there next Monday. This is the recovery room. You see brand new open space. Uh, the recovery rooms we have now, there are eight recovery beds. We're going to 32 because you need to have uh, regulatory re requirements, a certain number of recovery, recovery room beds per operating room. Some of them are single bedded rooms. You have a uh, patients with who need isolation, they have a single room. The ventilation in these rooms is different than they have in the uh, community-based areas. This is a radiation oncology. This is our linear accelerator. 
So for radiation oncology, it's the most advanced linear accelerator that there is on the market. It's about a $2 million piece of equipment. And this gives patients options. So they can have surgical options, they can have chemotherapy, they can have radiation therapy. And they can have a combination. It depends upon the doctor, it depends <coughs> upon the cancer. This is the most sophisticated piece of equipment and this opened up last Monday. This is our PET CT. So you have a CT that uh, is typically used for diagnostic, but the PET CT is a more advanced and they can use that for diagnostic as well as treatment. And again, this is something that the, um, the hospital has invested in, in, uh, in this equipment. So this is the newest um, part of the hospital that's opened up. And so we've added, radiation oncology is a brand new service. So it's coming to Westchester, right? So we've expanded the infusion because there's a demand for it. We recruited four more medical oncologists who adds to the three that Lawrence has historically had. So we had three medical oncologists and they use the infusion base, but when you double the size of it, you need a larger infusion base. But that was the foresight of all the people before me that, you know, look, I'm gonna get there and stand there and cut the ribbon, but my predecessor, the former CEO at Dynan and the board, they really had the foresight to create this happen. He, he, you know, he, he retired from the organization before it opened, but we're having him back so uh, he can be there for the ribbon cutting because it was his uh, brains and uh, forethought to make sure that this happened. Um, but it is, um, uh, this is exciting. This is a great thing. Let me just stop and see if there are any questions for me. Question. Well, the oncology, each service line you look at, we have demographic data, we have data from the state, we have data from the federal government that, that you could see what's happening in each of the communities and you have to look at the demand for services in the community. You're talking to your physicians, you're looking at where there's a backlog to get care. And so you start to make some strategic decisions about services that are needed. Remember, you're trying to match the clinical need in the community with the services at the hospital. And over time, those services change as the healthcare needs change. And it will change over time, again, as we have more primary care physicians out in the community, we have more uh, patients seeing those primary care doctors in the community and not using the emergency room as their primary care physician. But if you think about it, we're a society of convenience. You can go to the bank 24 hours a day, you can go to the grocery store 20 hour, 24 hours a day. I wanna go to my doctor 24 hours a day and people are doing that and they're going into the emergency room. The emergency room is not as random as you think. You see patterns in the emergency room over the course of the day and the day of the week. Right? So that just tells you that not every person who comes into the emergency room is an emergency. So we look at the available services in the community. We look at the demand by the community and then we look at is there an opportunity for us to add a clinical service there that will meet the needs of the community. So it's based on a lot of data that we look at. We don't, we don't do it randomly. We're very thoughtful because adding an infrastructure is, is pretty expensive. I mean, you see a lot of uh, commercials on television about like, if, you, if you have cancer, come to this, this hospital, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can you tell me why a consumer or how a consumer could choose the best place for if they have cancer and why they should go to Lawrence? It's a good question. Um, why should they go to Lawrence? Y you know, my personal belief is that 
Um, New York Presbyterian, as I started with, is one of the premier hospitals in the country, and we work with two of our Ivy League medical schools. So those three institutions are on one roof, and the goal is to continue to provide the highest level of care. So we're bringing the clinical procedures that you get at Columbia to Lawrence. So we have a tumor board. So in cancer, there's a tumor board where the docs and the clinical providers sit down and go over cases to talk about how to manage them. We've connected our tumor board at Columbia, our tumor board at Lawrence, and our tumor board at Hudson Valley together. So they'll have a combined tumor board. And so the physicians and the oncologists that we have that are doing the research, that are making the uh, advances in care, they're the ones who are part of our process. They're the ones who are uh, in, our, um, in our Columbia Doctors Group and making the changes to uh, how we treat cancer across the board. And so they're part of us. So you get access to our clinical trials. You get access to our tumor board. You get access to some of the brightest minds in medicine. That's what I think the difference is. At Lawrence, what would you say today the pluses and minuses of Obamacare are? Well, you know what? It, 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 the Obamacare is changing, um, is changing health care uh, radically. And as I said earlier, it's gone from volume to value. So we're now measured, and you can go online and look at how every hospital is measured. We're measured on quality. We're measured on our patient experience. And there are a significant amount of over 1,000 indicators that we have to submit to the government. Uh, that there's a lot of administrative uh, overhead that has to go with doing that. Uh, I think it's done. Um, I think the uh, Affordable Care Act there's done some real positive things that have gone on with that, and there are some things that they're going to have to adjust as we go forward. And you hear that from CMS, you hear that from our presidential candidates. There are things that are really working and things that need to change. And we live in a regulatory environment where we're going to have to make those changes. Um, but we're in a transition now. There's more people insured, but less money in the system. So we have to adjust how we're caring for patients and what our infrastructure is. And that requires us to think about that every day. Um, there's a lot of managed care. Do you have contracts with certain managed care? And um, how extensive is it? We have contracts with almost all the insurance companies because what, what we are doing is we're standardizing our contracts from New York Presbyterian and all of our regional hospitals. And so being one of the largest healthcare systems around, we have to have contracts. We don't have contracts with everybody, but most insurance companies we have contracts with, so you could get your care here at Lawrence. What about unions, the union contracts? I'm speaking specifically, 1199 came to Westchester. Yeah. They, they put people under managed care very limited um, doctors, whatever, in Westchester. Do you have contracts with other unions? We do. We have contracts with the different uh, employer unions. But that's a, uh, who we have contracts with is with the, uh, you know, it's, it's a negotiation between the union and who they want in their health care systems. And that depends upon who their members are saying to the union, well, we want you know, this physician group, we want these hospitals in our union, you want to have access to them. So that's a relationship between the union and its members, and then they develop a contract with the hospitals. But yes, we do have contracts with 1199. Um, have you guys considered yet, I mean, considering that you're now growing a geographic footprint that is large enough to, to sustain, I mean, you know, it's almost its own insurance company. Has you guys actually considered creating an insurance provider to manage the people in your geographic footprint merely as a way to kind of push out the rest of the uh, insurance in that area. I mean, so that way you don't have competition from that. Uh, you can then kind of 
force your own reimbursement, or you can manage that reimbursement. Has that ever come, or like come to an idea? Because it just, it makes, at least to me, it makes business sense. Does it for? We're, we're, a, we're a healthcare provider. We're not going to be an insurance company. Now, clearly, um, at some point in time, if the board and our CEO of New York Presbyterian make that decision that they want to invest in an insurance company, we'll certainly adjust and we'll do that. But previously, the Columbia campus and the New York, Pres and the New York Wall Cornell campus, prior to merger, each had their own insurance companies and each got out of the business because it's very hard to compete unless you have millions of patients because the, the risk stratification that is needed there. Um, I don't think anybody can ever push Aetna out. They're a huge insurance company, I mean, so. In the, I mean, in the idea of your geographic location, you like don't have a choice. We want, we, we sh everybody should have a choice. You want people to have choices. That's what America is, is founded on. You don't want to have, nor would the government let somebody have a monopoly. Well, and I, I agree with that. It's just that it just makes, it, I just feel like it makes sense. I mean, to really, if you can provide, especially since this is all value driven, if you can provide the cheaper cost with the best quality, is it, I mean. Which then means the insurance companies will want a contract with us mm -hmm. because they're going to get pressure from their employees to their employers saying, we want New York Presbyterian in our network of benefits. We want to be able to have access to them because wherever they live or wherever they're working, mm -hmm. right, so they have that discussion with their employer who has that discussion with which insurance company are they going to offer to their employees. And we believe quality is what's going to separate us and we believe that the insurance companies are going to need to keep us in their network. We want people to have choices. Um, Mr. Fasina, you talked about the business side of healthcare. Um, there, there are a number of business students uh, in the room. Just uh, curious your advice to them if they're thinking about embarking on a career in say health management, health administration. I would imagine as you talk about how healthcare has become such big business, how you now need you know, smart business professionals to, you know, to help run it. Yeah, well, as I said earlier, you know, how I sort of moved around my career by taking roles that nobody wanted, but uh, I find it to be tremendously exciting. I love healthcare because it's changing all the time. You need to understand the economics of it. You have to understand the numbers. If you don't, you know, you could, uh, you could uh, spin in a wrong direction very quickly. The margins in healthcare institutions are very thin. But if you like change, if you're okay with change, I, I, I think it's a great industry to be in. If you're one of those people who are not comfortable with change, you may want to move into a different sector because the government and the regulations change all the time and we're adjusting on a daily basis on something new that comes out, whether it's a local ordinance, whether it's a state or ordinance, whether it's a, a federal ordinance, or whether it's the insurance companies changing what they want to cover or not want to cover. It's constant change, but from a student's perspective, hospitals are not the only place to get into healthcare. There is population health, there is big data, there is healthcare financing, there's healthcare investing, there is skilled nursing home administration, there's home care administration, there's ambulatory care management, meaning managing physician offices. There is so much and such a wide range of areas of healthcare that you can go into. It's not just about the hospital. Actually, the hospitals are are the anchor and the centerpiece right now, but the goal is to keep people out of the hospital. And, and how do you figure out how to do that? And you do it, you know, through looking at some of this data, you do it through strategic planning. So there's so much to do in healthcare. For, for, forgetting the primary care providers, which I didn't even mention, which is the nursing and the, 
a respiratory therapist and a physical therapist and the occupational therapist, the clinical providers, right, are the core of who we are. So you want to hire high quality people, not just clinically sound people, but that they have the right people skills. This is a people business. And we have to be able to provide a high level of care and we have to be able to exceed their expectations. He, here's what I talk about all the time at the hospital. How many people have had somebody in a hospital? Right? Over the course of your lifetime, everybody's gonna touch a hospital, right? How many people know somebody in a hospital where that patient was and they called them and said, hey, my mother's coming in, my aunt's coming in, can you make sure they take care of them? How many people have done that? Yeah, everybody who's had somebody in a hospital, if you know somebody, you're doing that, right? It, my goal is nobody should ever have to do that. We should be providing that high level of care and that high level of service that we're exceeding the expectations of patients and their families. You have a tough day at home. When you walk through the door, you're on stage. You have that ID on, people are watching you. They're listening to you and they're focusing on your behavior. Why? What else do they have to do? They're lying in a the bed. They're looking at the ceiling, they're checking the lights, and they're listening to conversations. And we talk to staff about that all the time. They know what movie you watched this weekend. They know what party you went to this weekend. You think you're in the hallway. They're in the room. They can hear you. You're on stage all the time. So you have to have, you have to be empathetic, and most people who are going into healthcare really have a good nature in their heart and they want to provide and help people. But it's not emotional for you as a provider because this is what you do. But what you have to remember, it's emotional and personal for the patient. Because now they're sick and they're coming into an institution that they don't normally go into. It's not like going into Bloomingdale's where they do it all the time and they know about it and they're comfortable. They're coming into a hospital they probably haven't been into it before and they're asking people they don't know to help them but they have to trust them. When you're standing on a line at a, at a store and you see a cashier, one who's smiling and one who's not. And you have your choice, where are you going? Which lane are you going in? You're going to the one that's smiling, right? It's natural, we're social beings, it's natural. So we have to be able to provide a customer service to the patient, to their families. You can't forget the families. And that's the focus that we put on at Lawrence. That's a focus that we put on at New York Presbyterian. That's the focus that our board and our CEO want every single person to have. And that's what you have to do. It's not just about the clinical care. The patient can't tell you whether we put the stitches in correctly, whether we casted the arm correctly. What they can tell you is was it neat, clean, and organized and then they, it, did it look like and feel like when I walked into the Four Seasons Hotel because that's what I'm used to. That's, that's what they measure you on, right? So there's a lot to do. And the clinical providers are the core of who we are, but they need to be on their game clinically, but they need to be on their game socially, and they need to be on their game from a the perspective of taking care of the patients and their family. Other questions? One more question. Sure. Of course. Uh, everybody's spoken about Obamacare and the insurance and, and that. Uh, I've heard a figure of that 8 percent of people who have insurance will be in the hospital for a year. Yeah. 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 Hospital course, high course of hospital stays, everybody, and everybody knows that you go in the hospital. Um, you, you may have insurance, but that insurance is paying like I don't know what is it a day, um, a, a lot. So the 
hospitals, a few days of hospital stays, uh, could cost thirty thousand dollars. And and uh, uh, and a lot of the changes that you've made are are being dedicated by the government, forcing you to consolidate and getting bigger to try and reduce your costs. What do you think are, are uh, that's in the future that that could be uh, uh, make more significant reductions in the cost of uh, hospital stays and and help of Obamacare and the insurance? Well, you, m moving patients to the right location for care. So as I talked about earlier, people use the emergency room as their primary care provider, right? There's a significant cost to that. It's probably one of the most expensive places that you want to go get your ambulatory care. So what the government is trying to do is to push people into the right locations for care. Ultimately, that's going to shrink the number of beds in the hospitals across the country because only the sickest of the sick are going to be in the hospital and there'll be other facilities that will take care of patients in different environments that are less expensive. One more question before I have to go? I, I talked to you, but go ahead. Hi, how are you? I was wondering, as a business major, you know location is everything for a business and you said that uh, the hospital was 15 minutes, each hospital that you know in Westchester County is 15 minutes away from, it's like you're 15 minutes away from it. So how did the hospitals choose their location and where to put like, the hospitals at the end? Well, um, they were chosen 100 years ago. <laughs> Lawrence, Lawrence started in Bronxville in 1909, right? Um, <clears throat> You know, so the, the, the facilities are there, and in this urban environment that we're in, you can't just pick up and move a hospital. There's not a lot of land around. So you have to renovate in place, and that's what you have to do. Up county and in the rural areas, you know, uh, you have more land you can move them around. You're probably not moving them from one community to the other, but you may move them from this part of the town to this part of town. It is a very expensive proposition to move a hospital. It's very expensive to build a new one and move patients from this building to this building. Now, which we've done. We, when we built the Milstein Hospital Center at Columbia, we had to move patients from the old Presbyterian Hospital to the new Milstein Hospital building or down at our 68th Street campus, from the old hospital bed tower to the Greenberg Pavilion. That is a highly choreographed, very detailed focused proposition to move and as our nursing colleagues would know, you're moving an ICU patient with everything that they're hooked up to from one building and you're wheeling them down and you're putting them on an elevator and you're getting them into another building, that's pretty significant. Moving it from one town to the other is a whole nother world, so these hospitals were placed there um, years ago and I just have to worry about making them efficient rather than deciding where they go. <laughs> One more and then last question. Yeah. Um, I want to volunteer my time at Oncology Bronxville. Yeah. Alicia Holland right here. She'll help you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank much. you.